looking at the Christmas story from today? Philippians, that's right. Philippians chapter 2, if you would like to turn there, you are going to know Philippians 2 verses 5 through 11 inside out by the time next Sunday is over. As you're turning there, I do want to share one of the prayer requests that was handed to me right before uh, this past service. Uh, it comes from James Atterbury. James was in our uh, 8 o'clock service. He has a sister in Bakersfield. Her name is Lori Rocco. She is in the hospital. Uh, she is not eating at all. She has lost about 60 pounds. Uh, they can find nothing physically wrong with her. Uh, he believes this is a spiritual and emotional challenge at the moment that she just has no hope. And so they are traveling there right now. They came to early service. They're normally in this one. And they are on their way down to spend uh, the day or two with his sister. So please be praying for them throughout the day as, as they have this time with her. In fact, let's just pause to pray. Our Father, there are so many concerns that are going on. Our bulletin is filled with them. We've shared a variety already, and, and now one more. So we pray for Lori Rocco today, even as uh, her brother James and his wife travel down there. I pray that you'll give them peace of mind as they travel, as they head into a situation that uh, is uncertain for them. It's uncharted waters for them. Uh, but Lord, may they have a sense of your presence and that your influence in them is a calming factor in their lives. I pray that um, they'll have a dependence upon their think, a dependence in their thinking upon you, as uh, they don't fret or worry about what to say, but have confidence that you will bring to their attention exactly the right thought, the right expression, um, maybe the right illustration or story that uh, that connects with Lori. We pray for the staff there at the hospital, from the medical to the psychological team. Uh, give them wisdom and discernment and best practices. But Father, most of all, uh, we pray for your divine intervention in these circumstances. And we commit these needs to you. As just as we trust you with the other needs that we've already shared, we lift this one up to you as well. In Christ's name, amen. If you are visiting with us today or you're newer to our fellowship, you may not realize, but we're wrapping up in these few weeks a series of sermons we started back in late spring called Joy and Laughter. You never can have too much. You can only have too little. Unfortunately, within the life of Christians, there uh, often doesn't seem to be near enough laughter. And so we spent several months looking at what does the Bible have to say about laughter and found out there's a lot to be said. And uh, it's, it's rather humor. <laughs> the, the, the humorous side of this subject is there's a lot of Christians who say they are filled with joy. Somehow they never tell their face. And uh, we often don't see that expression of an inward joy uh, even in the midst of challenging circumstances. And uh, certainly, uh, we don't often see it a lot in worship. And of course, I love to laugh and hope that uh, we enjoy lots of time of laughter around here. So we've taken the time to intentionally uh, laugh at things and then trust also we've learned a little bit more how to laugh at ourselves. But then we have landed in the book of Philippians, which is known as the book of joy in the Bible. From chapter 1 to chapter 4, uh, the foundational truth or principle that Paul highlights is this subject of joy. And joy is different than happiness. Happiness is dependent upon the happenings that are going on around us that make us laugh or smile. And those can be very, very fleeting but Paul deals with a source of joy, and that source of joy is a relationship with the person, Jesus himself, that we can have in and through any kind of situation or circumstance. Not every circumstance is a laughable situation, but in every circumstance, we should have this sense of joy that would enable us to laugh even in moments of our own desperation. So, we have not taken a moment or two in recent weeks just to intentionally sort of try to laugh. Now, we've laughed some, but it hadn't been intentional. So, just before I jump into today's Christmas message, two quick things uh, that are connected to Christmas that I hope will put a smile on our face. Now, I am going to apologize at the outset to every blonde in the service. <laughs> My wife is included in that number. Um, 
Now, I realize some of you who are blondes are blondes from birth. <laughs> some of you are blondes by choice. It's okay. Um, I actually, I have a whole new appreciation for those of you who have color by choice. I was waiting to get my hair cut yesterday and I had to wait extra long because a gentleman ahead of me wanted his hair colored. I got to tell you, I've now lived 65 years and that is the first time I have ever witnessed that process. <laughs> I promise you, I will never do that to myself. <laughs> it's, it's, ladies, I commend you. It's, it's, they stuck this heat lamp over his head. He baked his skull for an hour. Uh, wow. But anyway, uh, so, but, so I do have a blonde humor for you at the outset. Two blondes went deep into the frozen woods searching for a Christmas tree. After a couple of hours of sub-zero temperatures and a few close calls with wolves, one blonde turned to the other and said, I'm chopping down the next tree I see. I don't care, care whether it's decorated or not. <laughs> I don't care who you are. You got a bit. That's kind of funny. All right. That's kind of funny. <clears throat> now let's get spiritual. A Sunday school class was putting on a Christmas pageant, which included the story of Mary and Joseph coming to the inn. One boy so very much wanted to be Joseph this year. But when the parts were handed out, a boy that he didn't like very much was given that part. And he was assigned to be the innkeeper. He was pretty upset about all this, but he didn't say a word to anybody. During all of their rehearsals, he was thinking, what can I do the night of the performance to get even with that guy? Finally, the night of the performance came. Mary and Joseph come walking across the stage. They, go ahead and answer that. They, they knocked on the door of the inn, and the innkeeper opened the door and asked them gruffly, what do you want? Joseph answered, we'd like to have a room for the night. Suddenly, the innkeeper threw the door wide open and said, great, come on in, I'll give you the best room in the house. Dumbfounded by this response, Joseph didn't know quite what to say for a moment. But thinking very quickly on his feet, he looked inside the door, past the innkeeper, and then looked at Mary and said, No wife of mine is going to stay in a dump like this. Come on, Mary, let's go to the barn. <laughs> and the pageant was back on track. All right. <laughs> well, all right, you've laughed a little. Let's go to Philippians chapter 2. Lynn Johnston, some of you might recognize that name, Lynn Johnston. Lynn Johnston wrote a comic strip called For Better or Worse. And one Christmas she wrote about a mother and a daughter that were out Christmas shopping. And the daughter says to the mother, if Christmas is more about God than Santa, how come people talk more about Santa than God? And the mother responded, God does less advertising. Is the mom right or wrong? I want to make two suggestions to you today. One, I think the mother's probably right because I think God primarily does his advertising in this book right here. And we're going to look at what he says about that in Philippians chapter 2 in just a moment. But I want to make another suggestion to you and I'd like for you to think about this throughout the sermon. Apart from the scriptures, and remember it is in the Gospel of John chapter 1, where the Christmas story again is told in a rather unique way. It's different than Matthew and Luke. In John chapter 1, uh, John beginning at verse, I believe it's verse 14 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus came to be the living Word, and the written Word is an expression 
of the living word, Jesus. But you see, the story of Christmas also says that he shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. And Paul later goes on to write in one of his epistles, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So the one who came from heaven to earth to be a reflection of the living word of God of heaven now once again wants to come be God in us expressing himself through us into the world. And as Major Thomas said about 20 years ago, you and I as Christians, not you and I as Baptists or Presbyterians or Methodists or Episcopalians, but you and I as believers in Jesus Christ, we are to be the walking advertisement of deity. I love that when I heard it. You and I are the intended plan and purpose of God to be a walking expression of, that gives testimony to who he is. You and I are to be walking billboards. And so here's the question. Is the light turned on on your billboard? Remember a few weeks ago I told you about the three ornaments in our front yard. Two words on each ornament. They're big wooden ornaments. They're this size. Unto us a child is born. It's a public advertisement for everybody to read as they look at the nativity behind it. So when they walk by our yard, they can see a testimony of God. So the question is this for each of us. Uh, forget our yards for a moment. As we walk the streets of our community, as we walk the halls of our home, as we walk within our neighborhood, as we shop in the stores, are we a walking advertisement that unto us a child has been born? See, it may not be so much that God hasn't got an advertising plan, it might be that those of us who are part of that plan have turned off the lights. See, those three ornaments in our front yard would be hard to read if we didn't have a spotlight shining on each one of them. In fact, after 10 o'clock, you would have to get right up close to read them. So what kind of light is shining through us onto the name of Jesus Christ that we profess as Savior and Lord. I think God does far more advertising than people think, but it's just not done in stores or on TV. Instead, God's favorite place to advertise for Christmas is in the scriptures and in the lives of his children. So, I believe Philippians 2, 5 through 11 happens to be a place where God does some of his best advertising. Here's what it says. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Let, let me pause again just for some personal reflection right there. Your attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus. You, you're sitting here, the vast majority of I look out, I see you every Sunday. There's some new faces. Thanks for being here. You honor us by your presence. But the vast majority of you have no reason to believe you're not someone who has invited Christ in your life. But, but let me ask you this, self-reflection. Does the attitude you have today look more like Jesus than the attitude you had two, three, four years ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago when you invited Christ in your life? Or is your life about the same it's always been. And I ask that question really very ser seriously and very genuinely because I've had some conversations recently with folks who tell me about, oh yeah, I went to this thing and I... But they've never read another verse in his word. There's no fellowship with God at all. There's no prayer. Nothing's going on. So, what my concern is, is that 
there are lots of people who fall into this category that Jesus talked about. When Jesus said, there are a lot of people who call me Lord who are going to be surprised when they die. There's a lot of people who call me Lord, Lord, but they know nothing about me. And so Paul says, let this mind be in you. Let this attitude be in you, which was also Christ Jesus. So as he describes this attitude, he's going to explain to us what this attitude should look like. And so the question is, do we have a developing attitude going on in our life that is reflective of the description that Paul writes about the attitude of Jesus? If we don't, then there's one of two problems. One is we might not be a Christian. And I would strongly encourage you then, if that's kind of the conclusion you come to, change that today. Before the service is over, we'll have a time to pray, do something about that. The, the, the other suggestion is, the other option is, um, again, Major Thomas, one of my, my favorite preachers, he's in heaven now. Uh, I saw him on a couple of occasions do this illustration. He, he brought a lamp in. He plugged it in, and he screwed the bulb in, and he pulled the switch, and nothing happened. And we had another lamp here, and he took the bulb out of the lamp where it didn't work, and he plugged it in the one that did, and he turned it on, and the bulb showed brightly. He took another bulb out of his pocket and put it in the one that just worked with this bulb and saw that that bulb worked and then he took that bulb and he put it over in this light and he turned it on and it still didn't work. Checked the plug and it was plugged into the same plug so it wasn't the plug that was the problem. The power was getting to the lamp but the power wasn't getting to the bulb. And then he took out a little pocket knife and he scratched off the end of that bulb where corrosion had developed. And he cleaned it off, blew it away, and he put it back in the lamp and he screwed it in and he turned it on and the light showed. And he was illustrating that, okay, the bulb is connected to the lamp the power wasn't showing through. So you could be here today and be a Christian. You, you're, you're connected. You're, you're, you're screwed into a relationship with Jesus. But things have gotten corroded at the point of contact. And so the light isn't shining through. Then may I suggest to you, if you'd like to see your attitude today start becoming more and more like the attitude of Christ... Let him come quickly and clean off the corroded area that's broken the fellowship between you and him. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, found in appearance as a man, humbled himself, became obedient to death, even the death on a cross. Therefore... As a result of that kind of life, God the Father exalted Christ the Son to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, and at the name of Jesus every knee would bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is the Lord, the glory of God the Father. In these verses, I find three things that Christmas reveals to us about God. Number one, Christmas reveals to us the grace of God. Grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace, the loving kindness of an angry God. God was angry about sin, but he loves you and me. And so instead of taking out the results of sin on us, his loving kindness was extended to us. Number two, Christmas reveals to us the gifts of God. By his grace, he gives us gifts. And then number three, Christmas reveals to us the glory of God. So let's jump in, look at each one of those briefly. Number one, Christmas reveals to us the grace of God. How does it do this? Well, in the verse, it talks about our attitude being the same as that of God who made himself nothing when he didn't have to. 
See, Christmas is a huge help in revealing Christ's attitude towards every one of us. I want to tell you a few things in case you don't know them about what this attitude means. Number one, Christ has more than a good attitude towards you. When you were a kid and your attitude was bad, did your parents ever say, you better change your attitude? Just shape up right now. Change that attitude. Uh, I'll never forget um, uh, Richard and Ola Mae Laughlin. These were was a couple of my dad's church when I was a kid growing up. And uh, Ola Mae was sort of at that stage of life where things uh, were changing a lot. Um, and she was hot a lot. Um, <laughs> and, and she was not being very nice to her husband a lot, okay? And so uh, she tells this story on herself. She said, you know, one day Richard came in, said something, I started crying. I went and laid down on the bed and just cried and cried and cried. After about a half an hour, Richard came in and said, Ola Mae, I don't know what's going on with you, but I'd like to figure it out. And she said, between sniffles, I told him, well, Richard, I'm just going through the change of life. He said, Richard looked at me and looked at his watch and said, Ola Mae, you got about five minutes to finish this change. <laughs> and, and, and somehow, some way, there was an attitude change. It, it, things got better for them right then. Well, God has uh, an attitude change for us. And sometimes we need an attitude change in our own life. But here's what I want you to know about Christ. Is Christ has more than a good attitude towards, towards you. I'm here to tell you that Christ has more than a great attitude towards you. What I'm here to tell you today is Christ has a grace attitude towards you. That means his attitude about you is not dependent upon your behavior. His attitude towards you is dependent upon his love for you. And his love is like this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That is the attitude of grace. Though he was God, Christ made himself nothing, and he did it just for you. Though he was God, Christ took upon himself the very nature of a servant, and he did it just for you. Though he was God, Christ was born in human likeness, and he did it just for you. Jesus said, I'll make myself nothing so that you can become everything that God wants you to be. Is that not the grace of God? Jesus said, I'll make myself a servant so I can come and help you. Is that not the grace of God for you? Jesus said, I'll make myself a human so that you can come to know me. Is that also not the grace of God to you? The word became flesh. And he made his dwelling among us and we have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only who came from the Father. Listen to this. Listen to what John writes in 1.14 who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Jesus came to the world filled with grace. And that's what can change our attitude. That's what can change our circumstances. That's what can change our destiny. I don't have to go to hell. I can go to heaven. I remember when uh, both of my sons were born, he was, they, they were both delivered by Dr. Nix. Now, most of you men never, ever saw Dr. Nix. Okay, he was a gynecologist. <laughs> the only time I saw him was in the delivery room. He was there for both, both babies to be born. And I'll never forget after Brant was born, and we're there in the room, and we're holding Brant, and Nick says, Roland, come down here. And he picks up off this big tray, this ugliest thing I'd ever seen in my life. It wasn't Brant, okay? <laughs> it was the placenta. And he lifts it up and he turns it inside out. And he said, Tim, I don't know when, and I don't know where, and I don't know how. But in here, and what I'm holding inside this placenta, is the key to the cure for cancer. He said, cancer cells never, ever show up here. What I'm holding, it's not here. Somewhere, somehow, some way, they're going to figure it out. This last week, as I was remembering that story, Jesus, wrapped in a placenta, processed that out at his birth in a barn. 
And the baby held in that thing that Dr. Nix thought held the cure for cancer. That placenta held within it Jesus Christ. The cure for our soul's cancer. The cure for sin. I don't know how. But he's the answer. Secondly, Christmas reveals to us the gifts of God. Not only the grace of God. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, was obedient to death, even the death of the cross. When people think of the first three gifts ever given at Christmas, what three gifts do most of us think about? Yeah, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But there's a second set of gifts that were given at Christmas. The first set of the three gifts given at Christmas were three gifts given by God himself. And so maybe you're saying, what are those three gifts? Uh, first of all, God gives to all of us the gift of Christ's humility. Let this mind be in you, which was also in him. Being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself. Jesus swapped his throne in heaven for a manger in Bethlehem. That's the gift of humility. Since none of us could ever be humble enough to go to heaven, Christ humbled himself instead and came to earth. We could never get to God, so God came to us. If God did not humble himself and come to earth in the person of Christ, then you and I would never find God. The gift of Christ's humility is such a great gift because it makes it possible for us to know and relate to God. That which was from the beginning which we have seen with our eyes, which we've looked at and our hands have handled. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. Those are the words of, of John when he wrote that first verse in the first chapter of the letter called 1 John. John the apostle was saying, I know God because I know Jesus and he is God. Is God that personal to you? I hope you don't change your voice when you pray. Have you ever heard people who do that? Their, their voice changes when they pray. Uh, there's a guy I went to Bible college with. And uh, I'll never forget the first time that the president invited him to preach in chapel. He gave all of us a little experience to preach in front of the rest of our fellow students. And I'll never forget the time that uh, he, was, he was one of the rare guys that's shorter than I am. Just as sometimes blondes have to put up with blonde jokes, I have to put up with short man jokes. And, and, and this was one of the few guys I was in Bible college with that was a little bit shorter than I was. And he, was, he, he had a very quiet, soft voice. He, he spoke very gentle. And the first time he preached, he was invited up to the podium. And, and in those days, you remember pulpits, right? Big wooden you know, monstrosities, usually this wide and this tall and solid as, a, as an oak tree. And he gets up behind it and he asks us to turn to the text and then he says, let us pray. And it got quiet. And then all of a sudden, dear God, we're so glad to be in your presence. It just, it caught me so off guard. I looked up, you're not supposed to look up during prayer. But I looked up. And he was nowhere to be found. I couldn't see him anywhere. He was on his knees behind a pulpit. I was so shocked. And I, and I heard him 15 years later. He did the same thing. Guys, when you talk to, talk to him just like you talk to anybody else. He comes to be that personal with us. He comes to relate to us. That's part of this, this gift of grace. The, the second gift that he's given to us is the, the gift of obedience. Not only humility, but obedience. The gift of Christ's obedience is such a great gift because it cancels out our disobedience. Do you get the picture? Christ exchanges his perfect obedience for our very imperfect disobedience. Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law, but I've come to fulfill the law, to do what you can't do. Did you ever play the white elephant gift game? Do you ever do that? Yeah, a lot of people bring a gift, all right, and usually it's junk, okay? But, but the, the party planner makes sure there's really one cool gift because part of the white elephant thing is exchanging the piece of junk you got 
for the really cool gift that somebody else had already opened. And that's part of what creates this tension in a party. You're just making people fight. Okay? <laughs> but, but, but you exchange your junk for somebody else's treasure. This is the great exchange that Christ in his obedience did for us. He comes to exchange our rebellion and disobedience for his obedience. God wants me to exchange everything I've ever done wrong for everything that Christ did right. My rebellion for Christ's submission. And just in case y'all aren't familiar with this idea, another word for disobedience? A lot less letters to spell. It's called sin. Sin is that which separates us from God. The third gift revealed at Christmas is the gift of Christ's death. Even the death on a cross. Jesus came for only one reason, to die on the cross for our sins. The scripture says, you shall name him Jesus, for he shall save his people from his sins. What three greater gifts could there be at Christmas than the gift of Christ's humility, his obedience, and his death and resurrection? The last gift is Christmas reveals to us the glory of God. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, gave him a name that is above every other name. All right, Santa may get more advertisement at Christmas time, but let me ask you this. When somebody's in an ICU unit, what name do they call out? Is it Santa or is it Jesus? When someone has just faced financial ruin, what name do they often call out? When a, a relationship is in trouble, where do we often? It's never Santa. His name has been raised above every name. So high that every knee will bow. Someday, every knee will bow. Someday, every tongue will confess. Nobody will be left out of this. But the timing, folk, is absolutely important. You see, Christ Jesus has been exalted to the highest place. Christ Jesus has been given the highest name. Jesus is Lord. It's what Paul wrote in Philippians. It's what Thomas said in the room that Jesus suddenly appeared in after his resurrection. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. What does it mean to call Jesus Lord? It can be summarized like this. I acknowledge that Jesus really is God. Have you made that acknowledgement personally? Number two, I believe that he has everything under control. Remember this. I, can't, I wish I know who said it. Whatever is over our head, do you ever feel like you're not even treading water, but you're drowning? Remember, whatever is over our head is still under his feet. God is in control. Acknowledge he's God. Believe he's in control. And number three, commit all of my life to him. We often talk about priorities, first, second, third, fourth. Not my favorite perspective. I'd rather us look at life as a wheel. Who's at the hub? What is the center of your life? All the other spokes is family and work and church and hobbies and other things. But what's the hub? If the hub is Jesus, all the other spokes will make the tire turn properly. And so when Jesus is Lord, he's the hub. And last of all, Christ Jesus is to be given the highest praise. Every tongue confess, every knee bow. Let me tell you how I can relate this timing in a way I hope you understand. Whether you acknowledge Christ in life or not, you will acknowledge Jesus for who he is in eternity. But timing is the difference maker. If you acknowledge him for who he is before death, you get the benefits. If you acknowledge him after death, you don't get relief from the consequences. Let me connect this to the stock market. Last Thursday, I believe it was, the stock market went up 220 points. I'm told that's a really good day. If at 3 o'clock California time, 
you saw the market up 220 points and decided, I want to get in on that, you were too late. Because the bell had already rung. There's an opening bell and a closing bell on Wall Street. When the closing bell rings, too late to take advantage of the good rise in the market. The, the flip side is also true. Back in 07, 08, the stock market plummeted hundreds and thousands of points. If you waited till the bell rang after it dropped hundreds of points, it was too late to, ex to escape the consequences of a delayed decision. The same is true about the closing bell in life. Once we die, it is too late to benefit from God's special gift or to escape the consequences of ignoring that gift. We've looked at Christmas and what it reveals about God from Paul's perspective. Are you here today and you're somebody who needs to receive the gifts of grace from God today? Do you need to accept him into your life? Not a fancy prayer, no special formula, but an honest confession of the soul that says, God, your attitude is not in me. I haven't expressed, oh, I, I, I think you've always been around, but I have never acknowledged that Jesus is God. I've never let you have control of my life, and I've never committed all that I am to you. Are you willing to make Christ the hub of your life, in your daily walk, in your daily work, in your daily worship. If you say yes, I promise you, you'll have the best Christmas ever. Let's pray. And maybe instead of just listening to me, why don't you talk to God out of your own heart, using your own words, in a tone as if you were talking to your husband or wife or mom or dad or best friend and let him know that you need him right now. Dear God, thank you so very much that you chose a moment in time to reveal yourself and we call it Christmas. Dear God, thank you for revealing your grace to us in the attitude and in the actions of Jesus Christ. And Father, there may be some in this room who at this very moment want to become a recipient of your grace today. Thank you for hearing their prayers. They don't need to stand up or come forward or raise a hand, though there's nothing wrong with doing any of those things. But what is most important is the openness of their heart to say, God, I don't want to ignore you anymore. Father, for all of us in this room, many who've already received your grace, I pray that if there's some corrosion at the contact point of our life with you, we'll admit it, acknowledge it, allow you to clean it up so that our attitudes will become more and more like you, so that the light will shine as an advertisement of who you are in my life and that it can make a difference in the lives of others. Father, thank you for the humility, obedience, and death of Christ for us. And most of all, thank you for the life that he imparts to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.